Hello and welcome to another episode of NICE News. My name is Fernando Florido, a GP in the United Kingdom. Today we'll be discussing the NICE guidance and advice published in April 2023, specifically for primary care. Now, in April there was only one guideline relevant to primary care, which was hypertension disorders in pregnancy. However, I must admit that the updated information was not easily accessible as it was buried in the middle of the guideline. So, to save time and effort, I have gone through and summarised the whole guideline. But please keep in mind that my summary is an extremely simplified version and it may not contain all the nuances and details that NICE often includes. If you'd like to dive deeper into the guideline, I have included a link in the episode description. Before we begin, I want to remind you that this episode is not medical advice, it is only my interpretation of the guideline and you must use your clinical judgement. Finally, I'd like to remind you that there's a podcast version of this episode, which can be found in the description below. And to help you remember the key points, I'll be sharing some fictitious clinical cases at the end, so make sure that you watch the whole episode. Now, on to the guideline itself. Hypertension disorders in pregnancy are generally managed in secondary care, but in primary care we must still be familiar with the recommendations. So let's get straight into it. Firstly, for the assessment of proteinuria, we will use an automated reagent strip. If the dipstick is positive, that's one plus or more, we will use albumin creatine ratio or protein creatine ratio to quantify the proteinuria, but we will not use an early morning or 24 hour urine collection sample. If using protein creatine ratio, 30 mg per millimole is the threshold for preeclampsia, whereas if using albumin creatine ratio, it is 8 mg per millimole. In terms of management of chronic hypertension in pregnancy, that is, hypertensive women that get pregnant, we must make sure that we refer them appropriately, we stop and prescribe an alternative to ACE inhibitors, ARBs and thiazide or thiazide-like diuretics as soon as we know that they are pregnant or planning a pregnancy. This is because of their teratogenic potential. We will discontinue treatment if the blood pressure is below 110 over 70 or if there are symptoms of hypertension. We will offer treatment if the blood pressure is 140 over 90 or higher and we will use a target blood pressure of 135 over 85. In terms of drug treatment, we will give labetalol first line, then nifedipine if labetalol is not suitable and then methyl dopa if both labetalol and nifedipine are not suitable. And finally, we will also offer aspirin 75 to 150 milligrams once daily from 12 weeks gestation. In terms of management of gestational hypertension, that is, a woman that becomes hypertensive during pregnancy, we will say the following. A full assessment should be carried out in secondary care, including blood pressure monitoring, urine tests, fetal monitoring, medication and delivery planning. We will admit to hospital if the blood pressure is 160 over 110 or higher and the treatment is also labetalol first line, then nifedipine if labetalol is not suitable and then methyl dopa if both labetalol and nifedipine are not suitable. In terms of hypertensive treatment during the postnatal period, if the woman is breastfeeding, We will say that the amounts in breast milk are unlikely to have any clinical effect. However, we will need to monitor baby's blood pressure and symptoms in case of hypertension, although this is usually done in secondary care. Enalapril can be offered during the postnatal period, but nifedipine or amlodipine should be offered for women of Black African or Caribbean family origin. If the blood pressure is not controlled on one drug, a combination of enalapril with nifedipine or amlodipine can be considered. And if this combination is not tolerated or is ineffective, atenolol or labetalol can be added. But we will avoid diuretics and ARBs if the woman is breastfeeding or expressing milk. However, if the woman is not breastfeeding, there are no special considerations and we will follow the normal guidelines on hypertension. And finally, in terms of advice and follow-up, 
we will advise that the overall risk of recurrence in future pregnancies is approximately 1 in 5. We will also advise that hypertension in pregnancy is associated with an increased risk of hypertension and cardiovascular disease in later life, and we will give lifestyle advice. If there has been prematurity before 34 weeks, we will consider pre-pregnancy counselling. Now let's use ChatGPT to give us some practical cases in the form of five fictitious patients. The first patient is Sarah, a 30-year-old woman who is in her second trimester of pregnancy and has no previous history of hypertension. Although she is asymptomatic, her blood pressure reading during a routine checkup reveals a reading of 145 over 92 and during deep stick shows one plus of protein. What is the next step? According to the guidelines, the next step would be to request an ACR or PCR to quantify the proteinuria. However, given the potential for Sarah to have preeclampsia, it is advisable to refer her urgently to the obstetricians for a full assessment, including fetal monitoring. Our second patient, Jane, is a 35-year-old woman with a history of chronic hypertension. She is on Ramipril, 5 mg daily, and she comes to see you because she is now pregnant. What should we do? Our first step is to refer her to the obstetricians. Additionally, we need to stop the ACE inhibitor due to the teratogenic effects and switch to an alternative medication. Labitalol, starting at 100 mg twice a day, is the first line option. We will need to titrate the dose to achieve a target blood pressure of below 135 over 85, though this is likely to be done in secondary care. Aside from the medication switch, Jane should also be prescribed aspirin 75 to 150 mg once daily from 12 weeks gestation to decrease the risk of preeclampsia. Helen, a 37-year-old pregnant woman with a family history of hypertension but no prior hypertension herself, is the third patient. At 36 weeks gestation, she sees you with no symptoms, but her blood pressure reading is 160 over 110. What should our advice be? Considering the high blood pressure level, hospital admission for close monitoring and management is recommended. Induction of labour may also be necessary due to the severity of her hypertension and her gestational age. Maria, a 32-year-old woman of black African descent who has recently given birth to her first child, is our fourth patient. She is currently taking labitalol for 100 mg twice a day for gestational hypertension. She wishes to breastfeed. However, she has been experiencing tiredness and cold extremities which she attributes to the beta blockers. What should we recommend? As per the NICE guidance for women of black African or Caribbean family origin, we should switch her labitalol to nifedipine or amlodipine, which are known to be more effective in this population and safe for use during breastfeeding. Although the medication in the breast milk is unlikely to affect the baby, we will arrange for the baby's blood pressure to be monitored in secondary care. Ongoing medication monitoring for her should also be done in secondary care. Let's consider the case of Stephanie, our fifth and final patient. Stephanie is a 39-year-old woman who has a medical history of chronic hypertension and has recently given birth to her third child. She is currently taking labitalol 200 mg twice a day and has decided not to breastfeed. How should we manage her? In such a scenario, it is simply recommended to refer to the NICE guideline on hypertension. If you require a refresher, you can refer to the relevant episode on this channel. We have come to the end of this video. I hope that you have found it useful. And if so, please hit the like and subscribe buttons. Thank you for watching and goodbye.